Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU CBA's special lecture series. My name is Young Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for International Business Education, often called a SIBE using acronym at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. LMU is one of 16 universities in the country that receive prestigious SIBE grants. The LMU SIBE serves as regional as well as national resources to help US companies and industries enhance global competitiveness. To fulfill this mission, LMU SIBE has been offering special lecture series on key and current international business topics that have significant implications for the US businesses. Today's webinar covers one of the most important and timely topics in this digital age, that is cybersecurity. As you all know, the global cyber threat continues to increase at a rapid pace with a rising number of data breaches each year. Countries such as Russia and North Korea have been accused of their attack on cybersecurity in the US. As the information technology has become critical, in competing in the global market, governments as well as companies should be more proactive to protect digital data, transactions, and networks. They need to develop effective cybersecurity strategies and practices to keep their businesses intact and sustainable. At the same time, it is imperative to develop the global cybersecurity workforce and build a security-first mindset. Today, we are very fortunate to have five experts who are willing to share their, their knowledge and experiences with us about this important topic. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Professor Ken Summers. Professor Summers is a senior lecturer in the LMU College of Business Administration, and he's also a technology consultant for small and medium-sized businesses in and around the Los Angeles area. He teaches a cybersecurity course at LMU and has received Distinguished Teaching Award in spring 2023. Thank you, Ken, for moderating. Ken, would Thank you, you very much. introduce our panelists today? I will absolutely do that. Um, I want to welcome our five panelists who are professionals, practitioners, and scholars in the area of uh, cybersecurity. I also want to welcome all of our uh, attendees, faculty, students, alumni, and members of the business community. Uh, if no one objects, I'm just going to use first names for the remainder of the evening. Um, I'm going to start by having our panelists briefly introduce themselves and their organizational affiliation. Then I'll ask my topic-related questions. I'll keep the discussion informal, and I want to encourage our panel to feel free to build on each other's perspectives and insight. And then at the end, if time permits, I'll take pertinent questions from the audience. So to begin, I'm going to ask our, our um, uh, panelists to introduce themselves so you're not stepping over each other. I'll ask uh, Keith Clement, Stephen Cook, Michael Costello, Tony Vitsa, and then Danny Lee. So first, uh, Keith Clement, if you could uh, uh, arise and introduce yourself, please. Uh, top of the afternoon, Kenneth. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to be here. My name is Keith Clement. I am a professor of criminology at California State University, Fresno, and I serve as the chair of the California Cybersecurity Task Force Workforce Development Education Subcommittee in addition to that, I am on the advisory board of the, Calif uh, the Cybersecurity Workforce Alliance, and I serve numerous other positions in AI and cybersecurity across the state of California. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Cook? Hey, everyone. My name is Stephen Cook. Um, I'm a manager of cloud security at SADA. Um, so we, I work mostly in professional services, helping companies uh, on the cloud perform security assessments, and implement um, tools such as cloud security posture management, SIM, and SOAR capabilities to help them uh, detect, respond, and identify threats across their entire IT lifecycle. Uh, prior to working at SADA, I was a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers, helping large multinational organizations improve their cybersecurity posture. And rumor has it, the Stephen, that you're also an LME grad. Yes, and I'm an LMU grad. <laughs> well done. Uh, class of 2018. Sweet. Uh, Michael Costello. Hey, everyone. Uh, also LMU grad, 
class of 2013. Uh, my career has been defined by the cyber insurance industry. So I was an entrepreneurship major uh, and started a cyber insurance company before that was a thing. Uh, as it stands today, we insure about 6,000 small businesses across the United States uh, and provide them with a cyber insurance policy that mainly protects them on ransomware and social engineering claims. Uh, we've actually paid out over $55 million in the past eight years to keep businesses afloat. So definitely got a lot of good war stories for you today. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Tony Visa. Oops. Good day, everyone. I'm just turning my camera on once it decides to actually work. There we go. Brilliant. G'day everyone, uh, Tony Vietza is my name. I'm an executive director with a Australian consultancy called Corda Mentha. Uh, we provide advisory uh, and support in relation to cybersecurity, uh, typically advisory and post uh, breach response and, and incident response. Um, formerly, uh, I used to work for uh, an organization based out of the US called ISC Squared as the uh, director of advocacy. So I did a, a fair bit of work uh, with the US, the UK, the Australian, and a lot of the Asia Pacific governments uh, around improving cybersecurity at a uh, international level. Um, and I've been working in the world of cybersecurity for about 25 years now. So it's been a, a fair bit previously on the board of the Australian Information Security Association here, um, driving, uh, driving uh, better cybersecurity standards across the Australian uh, ecosystem. And um, honored to be here. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, I just want to share that uh, my wife is Australian. She's from Melbourne. Don't hold that against me. I know you're in Sydney, uh, but it's traditional at a uh, Australian event to uh, welcome those who have traveled the greatest distance. So thank you for uh, coming all the way from, to us from uh, from Sydney. Uh, Danny. Lee. Hi there. Uh, my name is Danny Lee. My affiliation is with LMU. I'm a double alum. I currently serve on the College of Business Advisory Board. I serve on the uh, Board of Regents, as well as uh, I'm on the committees with uh, the Board of Trustees. As it happens, in my early years in high school and things, I was uh, a published hacker. Um, and along that way, I found my way into working with Anderson and ultimately coming to KPMG to start up our cybersecurity practice in the mid 90s. So I've been working in the information security space since uh, across uh, the world. I, I did a secondment uh, international rotation into Asia and ran that practice across 13 countries for 10 years. I'm back here now um, doing a lot of work in that space across privacy, security, resilience, and all of those issues. Glad to be here and glad to share. Thank and you, I am uh, a lion. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, we're really fortunate to have such a combined experience, expertise, and brain power here uh, today. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. Our overall arching theme is uh, applying a global cybersecurity mindset to achieve competitiveness. Uh, we're going to discuss cybersecurity and associated risk management challenges facing business today. So my first question is, what do you feel are the biggest cyber threats facing organizations today? And I'll let anyone start and then anyone continue. Well, I'll start. Um, the biggest cybersecurity threat today is really not uh, the traditional infrastructure up view of, you know, is the server secured? Are the encryption keys strong enough? Those are not really the big cybersecurity issues. The cybersecurity issues today is, do we have the right business model? Are we being fair in the market in how we allow entrance and serve customers and deal with our business partners? And this is most prevalent uh, right now in many of my clients that are dealing with the European initiatives around uh, DSA, DMA, and the New Deal. So there are a ton of regulations 
that are about how you serve customers and how you create a fair marketplace by using the information, the data that you have to either enhance, isolate, or you know, include uh, a more robust market for 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 the consumer. And um, this is this is quite difficult. Um, you know, when you when you talk about companies that have content, how do they moderate that content to make sure the content is going to the right place for the right users with the right reasons? And how do those reasons comply to both local regulatory issues as well as global uh, demands? And, you know, you have industry, you have so many different uh, areas and working in a, uh, in a fairly complex uh, organization like KPMG, we, we have to traverse all those uh, um, uh, vectors. So I'll pause there. Danny, I was going to—I was actually going to add to what you've just said. I think a lot of organisations um, globally, uh, definitely here in Australia, and what I've seen in my experience in the US, um, still regard cybersecurity as a different sort of risk. Um, where the reality is, and very often when I speak to organisations, uh, when I'm speaking with them, I say, "Look, it's actually a risk like any other risk that your business is dealing with." The challenge is that very often, because it's not as seen, and I say from a physical perspective, as a lot of the other risks, you know, for example, occupational health and safety or um, you know, whatever other risk the business is dealing with, it's often consigned to an IT team or maybe a cybersecurity team if you're lucky enough to have that. Um, so very often with organisations, I say, look, I urge them to look at cybersecurity risk as a risk that needs to be uh, planned for, mitigated, treated, in a, in a myriad of different ways and you as the organization know your business well enough you need to be treating it with what is reasonable in your circumstances you can throw all the money in the world at this or no money in the world but one day you're going to have to justify it to somebody and and as long as you can justify it uh, that's okay but um, my suggestion is think about it carefully from a risk-based uh, approach uh, who would have thought it would be required by the sec right for um registrants to declare when they have a cybersecurity incident. I mean, who would have thought of that, right? I mean, you, you're talking about SEC registrants, financial reporting, listing on the stock exchange. Why does cybersecurity need to be declared within such a small amount of time? Well, because if people who are involved, which is a large ecosystem of third-party vendors are aware of it, they can, that's insider trading. Right. So so it's it's pretty amazing in how pervasive security has been. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I think one of the big challenges in all of this these days is being able to find a skilled and talented workforce. I mean, let's let's face it, only about two thirds of cyber jobs are filled at any time. Folks are desperate to hire those that have experience, certifications and, and education, whatever that means. And and that a lot of decisions and mistakes can be made when we are running on a skeleton crew of, of a security team and three day weekends are no fun for those folks and, and other high, you know, impact periods. So I, I think that's one of the big issues. I think there's a lack of planning, both at the international level, let alone at the international collaboration level, um, strategic level, as well as national statewide. I mean, Check your own jurisdiction, your own city for what they're doing in, in all of this. And lastly, I think that one considerable business risk these days is a lack of understanding or foresight or omnipotence into what the future regulatory schemes, oversight, compliance, audit, those factors are going to be. Those have to be terrible risks right now. Do you invest in AI? Do you not invest in AI? Right? I mean, that, that, you all saw that movie, The Money Pit. Who knows where you're going with that kind of stuff in this embryonic phase? So that's that's my view. Thanks. Yeah, just I'd add to this, uh, Tony, I think you nailed it. It's having um, education first and foremost about the actual exposure itself. And that's uh, about half of what we do in the on the insurance side is, is just education. Uh, and then behind that, where we actually we get to see uh, thousands of actual cyber attacks. We pay the losses out. And when you look at uh, the vast majority of what 
causes the actual uh, you know attack to be successful. It's people. Uh, so human error is something that we focus on uh, quite heavily, and it's educating those employees on best practices. But it's also educating uh, the uh, company's uh, C-suite executives on what exactly they need to implement to uh, have a fail safe in place so their employees can't make mistakes. Uh, so it's it's a, a dual part um, education. And then uh, as far as kind of the major attacks, it's you know real life scenarios of uh, what actually has happened with ransomware and how that's evolved, uh, what happens with social engineering and um, letting them know kind of the statistics and frequency. And what we find a lot of the time is Early on, especially um, in the cyber insurance marketplace, no one thought it was uh, a real uh, coverage. And then they have some sort of incident that happens to maybe a competitor or something happens within their own organization. And then they have the, oh, wow, this is this is real. And they want to get the actual insurance at that point. Yeah. And for me, no, great points um, from the rest of the speakers for me. I tend to work a little bit more tactically um, with, with our customers. So some of the, the cyber threats we're seeing are just a lack of awareness of their assets. So understanding where their VMs are, their computers and networks, all this uh, these assets propagate in organizations. And many times they get it to an uncontrollably large uh, number and companies will have you know hundreds, if not thousands of dormant VMs or uh, computers in their system. They don't know what's happening on them. They don't know what's what's going on. And this allows attackers to hide in plain sight. There's tons of uh, you know untracked assets, things like that provide so many routes for attackers to to hide and uh, you know learn about environments and, um, and in the same vein, right? Like uh, having publicly accessible assets, like at having attackers being able to run it, run an nmap scan. Detect, you know, you know, ports and networks that are uh, that are publicly viewable on the internet allows them to, you know, poke at different environments and and potentially hack in them. So I think we see this with a lot of organizations, even some very famous public organizations you've heard of. They don't have the sort of awareness over their environment, and it proves to be uh, very hard to protect. And it scales with size. So the larger an organization is the more things they have to protect. Um, so in general, I feel like this prevalence of unknown things in their environment is a massive cyber threat in addition to what's kind of already been said. Well, Stefan, I think I'd just add to that, um, the number of devices in a company is something like double, if not triple the number of people. And the number of passwords is like an exponential uh, number above that, particularly privilege access. So if you have these administrators uh, that have special access to devices, those actually become really, really large numbers. And it is actually hard for many of our clients to deal with different businesses, different segments, different countries, different cities to manage all of this and lock all of this down. So, uh, but it is very easy to send a scanner out and just canvas uh the ip range right and and you're there so i totally agree with you Sifa. um I, I wanted to i actually wanted to add to to stefan's comments around um not being aware of uh the assets an organization has um so there's some data out there that suggests that if you look at the information that an organization holds somewhere close to about 15 percent of all that information is actually business relevant. So, so it's actually information they need to conduct business. About 35% of that information is rot or redundant, obsolete or trivial. So it's information that the business is keeping that they don't need, they're paying for, and it's a liability. It's a business risk. Over half the information that businesses typically keep is dark, i.e., to Stefan's point, they don't even know what it is. And it could be something as simple as an employee hooking up their phone to sync it to their personal device and syncing everything on their phones, or it could be downloaded content. We, you don't know what it is, right? That presents itself both as a business cost because the business is still needing to manage and, and maintain that and, and pay uh, cloud services or, or, or local VMs and keep them running. 
but it presents as a business risk. Here in Australia, over the last 12 months, we've had a number of really large breaches that have impacted probably half of the Australian population in total. Um, and in all of those cases, there's either been issues of privileged access, third party security concerns that, are, that have uh, manifested themselves as an access into a third party that's resulted into a breach into an environment. But almost always it's involved too much information that should never have been kept by the organisation in the first place. Um, so, so there are a number of different considerations when it comes to looking at very, a lot of these global risks. And I think you'll find that playing out in, in, in the US, very similar examples occur. Um, Colonial Pipeline is a, is a good example of a third party um, issue. Solar Winds, for those of you that remember, uh, is, is a, a hugely uh, impactful third party issue, which affected um, US government departments, over 10,000 organisations. Uh, around the world. I think this dovetails beautifully into sort of my next question, which is how can we best identify and manage these vulnerabilities that we've identified? I think one of the first steps that people like to take is just going back to the basics and fundamentals of information security. That is the understanding of knowing everything about your system architecture, as, as our previous excellent speakers have been mentioning. I mean, you know, organizations just have to know what they have. And I, and I mean that all across the spectrum. I mean, to the apps they're running on the devices that they, they give to their employees, right, to the password management tokens, to the just on and on and on. And, and that is that is really the first step of understanding your your risk and where the vulnerabilities and the threats are is a comprehensive understanding of your resources and your capabilities and capacities. And once you know all those kinds of things, I think that you're in a better position to manage your risk and be a little bit more risk adverse. So thank you. Yeah, I would say we have a, a unique uh, view into organizations because we ask uh, about four different pages of cybersecurity related questions. Uh, and it's very obvious uh, when we get those answers back, if the organization actually cares about cybersecurity uh, or they don't at all. And so I think it's really from the top down, the leaders within the organization, if they make that investment uh, whether it be someone on staff, whether it be outsourced and into the actual uh, cybersecurity softwares that can protect their business. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, and every business is a little bit different. And you would be absolutely shocked. Uh, I was working, I won't say the name of the business, but on an online uh, retailer that did 90 million in revenue today, uh, that did not have multi-factor authentication set up for their 200 employees, uh, which most businesses at this day and age got that in place a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's it's all, all around. It's you know from the top down how much the leadership is really pushing cybersecurity, investing in it, and then continuously monitoring it uh, because it's something that every year um, you have to have your finger on the pulse because hackers change how they hack, cybersecurity up, updates and gets better. Uh, it's just constantly evolving. Yeah. Michael, oh, go on, Stefan, you go. <laughs> oh, sure, okay, okay, cool. Um, so one of the things I do a lot in my day-to-day -day is uh, I run a solution that's called uh, security posture management, mostly in the cloud, but sometimes we go on-prem with some of our tools. But essentially what this is doing is what I described, you know, what we were talking about before, understanding your inventory of IT assets. Uh, in the cloud, you have the benefit of, you know, having everything uh, be callable via an API. So it's really easy to understand what's in your environment. But um, it's a really hot uh, cybersecurity tool market for posture management. There's a ton of competition. But essentially in this market, these tools all do the same thing. They look at your infrastructure and they... Um, they allow you to, you know, look for threats, look for misconfigurations and compare it against, compare your infrastructure against compliance baselines, 
whether that's uh, like CIS benchmarks or NIST or something like that. So that's a very good way to identify vulnerabilities. And clearly it's catching on because um, I think one of the companies we work with uh, is Wiz. They were one of the fastest companies in the world to become like $10 billion market value. So, and they were formed like two or three years ago. Don't know the exact details, but it's clearly a really hot market and getting a lot of traction. So, um, and that they are specific to cloud. So there's still this huge on-premise world that's much larger than cloud, but the idea of posture management, understanding what's in your environment and mapping it against, you know, but security benchmarks, commonly seen threats, and uh, misconfigurations, that's clearly catching a lot of steam. And then really quickly, the other thing, um, the other kind of suite of tools I use a lot in my day-to-day, -day, uh, and we see a lot of is called SIM and SOAR. Uh, some more acronyms for you, but essentially these two tools, you aggregate all the log data that comes into your organization, you alert on it, whether there's things that look risky, and then you somehow respond to it, whether you're using automation or human notification or something, but there's a whole suite of tools that uh, allows uh, you know organizations to identify and manage vulnerabilities. And AI is quickly, is AI is permeating everything I just talked about really quickly. So there's a lot of exciting stuff happening you know, as I speak and the, the, this year especially, um, you know, using sort of automation to reduce the amount of, uh, to, to kind of reduce the amount of toil around uh, identification and management of vulnerabilities. Stefan, I was going to I was going to add to your comments and to Michael's comments, and and I would encourage I know that that within the audience that we have today, there's probably a fair few students who are undertaking studies and the like. I would encourage you to remember uh, as you go forward in your studies uh, and going forward, two words that that are going to be absolutely critical to you going forward around understanding cybersecurity risk, and that is called risk governance. Now, what does risk governance mean? It means to the point where uh, Michael was talking about the organizations that, that he was working with, where they've incorporated cybersecurity from the very beginning as a risk, and they've established that as a people process and control approach across the business. You get far better outcomes than if you try to add cybersecurity on as an afterthought. And very often that's what organizations do. They develop some really good products and services and solutions. Um, and then they realize halfway down the track, oh dear, we have to secure this because we haven't secured it, right? Very dangerous. If you can build it in from the outset using what's called a security by design approach, uh, it is gonna be far more successful. And the best way to think about it from a risk perspective is if you think about the, the Indy cars or the NAV cars, for example, or, or Formula One, if you follow Formula One, those cars are risky vehicles. They drive really fast. But what makes them safe is the, the brakes that those cars have. And they're so good that they can slow those cars down to, to, to nothing. Risk is, is often a, a word that's poorly, mis poorly understood. But if you have risk management, which is what brakes are on those Formula One cars, to slow things down, you can also accelerate far quicker as a business going forward once you pull out of the corner and you can, you can take off. So if you have good risk governance, then that works really well across the business as a risk, treating risk when you see something that doesn't that, that's not meant to be doing what it needs to be doing, you can slow it down very quickly. But then when you see an opportunity, you can really take off and do that. And in cybersecurity, very often businesses hate cyber because they see it as a business disabler. Every time we put something in, it slows the business down. So it's around changing that conversation and making it a business enabler, which it can and, and absolutely should do. I want to launch from uh, Tony's com um, uh, comment about uh, risk governance. What do you all think about the, the differences in risk governance, in risk management, in the US versus other parts of the world, how do they, how might they differ? How might you approach that? Yeah, so one of the uh, parts of the cyber insurance policy that uh, provides coverage is for all of the liability associated with losing uh, sensitive data. And uh, it's probably no surprise uh, that the United States 
has some of the uh, highest regulation uh, in regards to uh, sensitive data. So we categorize it in, in three different areas. Uh, it's personally identifiable information. So uh, anything like a name, address, social security number, et cetera. Uh, and then protected health information and then payment card information. All three of those vectors are regulated by a multitude of uh, privacy regulatory bodies, whether it be on the state level, the federal level. Uh, and just to give you kind of a few examples, if you were to lose a health record, uh, if you're a hospital in California, you got it stolen, the federal government uh, through the uh, HIPAA Act, Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, can go in and fine your hospital up to $50,000 um, and force your hospital to, for assessments to upgrade your overall security. Behind that, the state of California has the confidenti Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, CMIA, and that allows for civil penalties up to $25,000 per person who's had medical information lost for each violation. So if you think about class action lawyers and medical records being stolen, uh, they just round up the people and we're looking at what we would call in the insurance world, a limit loss. Um, the entire $1 million limit, as an example, is going to be paid out defending the actual business um, in court and paying out those fines and penalties. So that's just a, a very specific example, but um, overall, uh, when these when information is lost, uh, it's a requirement uh, if you buy an insurance policy to actually have a data breach attorney uh, who specializes just in privacy law to navigate the business. And they work hand in hand with the forensics firms of what information was actually stolen uh, and advise them on here's what you have to do now that you lost this information so that you don't get hit with a major lawsuit from the state or federal government uh, or, or in the civil courts, uh, and you don't have to defend yourself or pay those fines and penalties. Michael, I'm, I'm happy to also add from a US perspective that um, having just written a paper on director's duties um, here in the Australian ecosystem, looking at the US system, a significantly um, well-advanced system to the extent now that you have uh, the SEC's final rule uh, around accountability for cybersecurity at a board level. Um, you also have case law in the US where directors have been pursued by the regulator for failing to act in a reasonable enough manner around guiding the organisation towards proper cybersecurity. There's been cases around that. There was also, of course, the very famous case around the CISO for Uber, uh, who um, ended up uh, in, in trouble uh, around the fact that there was, and this was more of a, a criminal matter, uh, where that individual was involved in, in hiding aspects of that cyber breach and, and got uh, uh, called into a, a case uh, by the regulator, uh, and there was a suspended jail sentence around that. So... Here in Australia, I can tell you that the regulator has said very openly, we will now pursue directors personally in the event where there is a, a case of reckless or negligent action as a, as, a, as a director. And that comes in part from developments that have happened in the US and, and what's been occurring there. So it is an area around governance, so going back to the governance piece, where at a board level, it has to be guided by the board. And I can tell you, for those of you that want to get into the technical side, if the board uh, on board, no pun intended, on <laughs> providing cybersecurity um, resources and, and support to the organization, it's going to be a far easier job than if the board think it's all a waste of time and money. Because if you're a CISO or working in the cyber team trying to get resources and the board don't think it's worthwhile, it's going to be a really awful job environment for you. I can, I can tell you that now. So um, you want to get the board on board. Well, you know, just to follow up on your comment about the comparison between different jurisdictions around the world, Tony, um, you know, I have, I have the privilege of working with both uh, GDPR, CCPA, as well as uh, PIPL. Um, 
uh, GDPR is the European Union's uh, privacy re requirements. CCPA is generally what we do in the US. And then PIPL is what they do in China. And um, it's that's just privacy. And then there's security. And, you know, in the US here, we have NIST. In Europe, we have NIS. In China, we have MLPS. So each of the major, I would just say that the three dominant markets out there have their own regimes around security, around privacy, and around data management. And it's very interesting, actually, um, how this all occurred. Um, and this is just a personal opinion. But you look at someone like Facebook, who was able to get 3, million, 3 billion likes, and they're able to sell the 3 billion likes. Well, in the US, we only have 330 million, maybe 350 if we, we work hard at it. So where did the rest of the 2.6 billion likes come from that they're able to monetize? Well, that's coming from other countries. And so very quickly, China kind of caught on to that and said, hey, wait, wait, the great wall, uh, the great internet wall of fire, right? The firewall comes up and there's no fire, there's no uh, Facebook inside of China because they want to protect their own market. They don't want anyone to monetize their people. Europe, it was already too late. It was already out, cats out of the bag. Everybody's monetizing it. So obviously that, that has a commercial impact on each of the economy. How do you tax that? Do you, do you tax that? What are the costs for doing that business? And you know, that's when, frankly, you see a lot of privacy regimes show up. And in Europe, the privacy regime for GDPR is all about individual human rights. You have a right to your data. You have a right to know what it's gonna happen, where it's being used, revoke it, uh, make it portable, bring it to somewhere else. That's all your right. Because the European Union is really a bunch of different countries working together. In the US, we said, hey, actually, we're going to do that too. You have your rights. You can look at your data. You can change your data. You can move your data. But actually, we own your data. We are the, cust we are the custodians and we serve you based on you, you know, signing off on the fact that you want free pictures or free messaging or whatever it is, but we still own that data and we can resell that data. And then when you go to China in the China regime, which I, I do a lot of projects over there, um, it's actually the same standards, the same methods, except it's the government that owns your data. And they get to tell you whether it's okay or not. They get to tell you hey, I don't want you to put the server outside of China. I want that server inside of China because it would help my economy if you bought technology from China, right? So there's all these subtleties in these regimes. And because we're in a learning institution that is very liberal in mind in, in, in LMU, I just wanted to show that juxtaposition of, you know, here's hardcore technology. We're talking about hackers. And then we're also talking about economics and legal and business models. And this is this is what I get really excited about in working with my clients and trying to think through some of these issues so that a global company can in fact normalize their standard, right? But these, these cyber rules and privacy rules are not really here to protect the infrastructure. And they, they are to a certain extent to protect the people, but it is really, about monetization of individuals in different countries. That's why you find five billion dollar fines, you know, being levied across different markets. That's these are these penalties are here to really help those countries reclaim that value of, you know, the, their their assets, which is people. So I'll pause there. Maybe a little bit far out there. But <laughs> well, well, Danny, actually, I think you brought up something really. Um, interesting because you earlier were talking about the CCPA and you're absolutely you hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, uh, the vast majority of privacy regulation does not protect the consumer um, in terms of the data ownership. The CCPA, for those who don't know, is the California Consumer Privacy Act came out on January 1st, 2020. Uh, it was landmark legislation 
that actually gave the consumers in the state of California uh, unprecedented control over their personal data. So that means if you're in the state of California, which a lot of lions live here, uh, and your information is being collected by an organization, you have the right to request that your personal information is deleted. You have a, a right to request uh, what, what personal information is being collected. And you have the right to opt out of the sale of your personal information. And if they don't comply, uh, consumers can file private lawsuits and recover damages up to $750 per violation. So if you're looking for extra money outside of class, just figure out who's uh, collecting your your data and, and not giving you answers. Yeah, no, great, great points. Um, yeah, CCPA, um, it was a very landmark uh, landmark decision by the U.S. to try to match the EU. So that was a that was a big change, but it, it is interesting, kind of seeing seeing how uh, in this situation with cyber, we're following you know other regions of the world, not necessarily the other other way around. Uh, my in my day to day, the you know kind of go, going back to the subject of what do we see in cyber risk management in the U.S. versus other parts of the world. Day to day, when I work with engineering teams of companies of our clients. Uh, there is a pretty stark difference between uh, the U.S.'s like development of cybersecurity in the U.S. versus uh, development of cybersecurity in other in other markets. I might not have like the the depth and breadth of experience of some of the other panelists here, but from what I have seen, um, in other parts of the world, cybersecurity can be a uh, you know an audit or legal issue, right? Solely, and then whereas in the U.S., it's being more and more shifted to an engineering problem. So that is something I have been seeing a little bit more of. Uh, in the U.S., we tend to throw more engineers at uh, engineers at cyber risks, um, whereas in the you know potentially like the EU, uh, they might not have the same level of uh, engineering competency that we we have in the U.S. Yeah, Daniel? you know, I think I'm sorry. I, I think that international risk management. Um, in some ways does have a lot of similarities in the sense that many of us are struggling with the same problem at any level of government, any size of corporation, as individuals or as institutions, that I think that we, we need to get more folks into government and more folks into the C-suite that understand CISO and information security related positions. And I think that that's one of the things that we're beginning to see clearly across the world in this area is a clear professionalization of cybersecurity. And, and one industry we can thank for that in all fairness is the, in, is the insurance industry because now you know government may be self-insured, but there are many out there that are seeking coverage that they don't have a plan. They have no idea what they're doing. They, they can't even fill out, um, like, like Michael was saying, there's folks, you can tell them a couple of questions how serious they are. And I don't know is probably not the way you answer insurance questions, right? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, we, if we don't get satisfactory answers, they're not serious about it. We actually just decline it. And it's tough for them to actually get insurance uh, in the marketplace. Yeah. And it's, and it's getting tougher because uh, it, it it's become abundantly clear. I do a lot of work with cyber insurers here in Australia uh, it's become abundantly clear that insurers are now um, having to ensure that um, from from a preparation perspective, the organization has at least mitigated. Sorry, let, let, let me let me start again. A lot of organizations, this is where they've struggled, is they've either viewed cyber insurance as the solution to everything, right? Or they viewed cyber insurance as, quote, a waste of time. Now, the truth is cyber insurance is a amazing risk transfer technique. However, to get to that point, you need to have done a large number of steps prior, i.e. get the business ready and secure enough to be able to stand on its own two feet and have the people process and technology controls in place to ensure that they can at least withstand most uh, attempts at being breached until they have to actually go to external services and support. And that's what cyber insurance is really useful for because if you do have a catastrophic breach and organizations can and do get targeted and suffer really horrible impacts, there is 
an insurance policy they can call on that brings in the experts. Very often, um, Michael, to your point, you've got a data breach lawyer that will pick up the phone and, and will start getting involved to regulators and, and mitigating those legal and reputational losses, or you've got crisis management. And these are people very different from cybersecurity professionals who are trained in the art of PR and can actually work through the organisation and its board to put out the right market messages. Um, and in fact, SolarWinds, I'll go back to the SolarWinds example, a lot of the issues they had was what they were miscommunicating um, at the outset of where their data breach happened to the market, which is why they've ended up in so much trouble years later, right? So, so it, in these sorts of instances, cyber insurance is hugely valuable and beneficial. Um, I wanted to go to um, the comments that were made around the different regimes in terms of privacy. And, and this is something I'm very passionate about because of my background. You'll often find as a cybersecurity professional, you're having to deal with many of these jurisdictions because guess what? We've got customers in the EU. We might have customers in, in um, Asia or whatever it might be. So incorporating some of those um, considerations when you design your own solutions for the companies that you're going to be working for going forward are going to be really important. And doing it without prejudice. And the reason why I say without prejudice is because if you look at the history and the legal systems of all these different um, parts of the world, they all have their own uh, backgrounds and there's reasons for that. The EU, the GDPR, um, is perhaps quite strict from a US or even an Australian perspective because of the fact that they had two world wars fought on that continent. And very often it was people's rights that were trampled on. And that's why people's rights have been so embedded into the EU GDPR. Um, and if you look at the way that, that Asia has done things, it comes down to very much a cultural um, uh, understanding of why things are done the way that they're done. Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to us, and, and I say the US and, and Australia, because we, we do have a very similar mindset towards things, but respecting that and taking that into consideration is absolutely critical um, when, you're, when you're dealing globally. Hey, Michael, I want to ask you a question. So uh, we have security engineers that work on networks and servers. We have security managers who work on process. We have security board members that work on governance. Do we have security uh, actuaries? I mean, are actuaries really skilled on cybersecurity to create triangles and rectangles on loss reserve, <laughs> loss? <laughs> yeah, well, funny enough, I was looking at an actuary's loss triangles on our own book of business today. Um, so how the insurance industry does it is we track each cybersecurity control that they have in place. And then we track what happens in a loss. So we figure out, you know, and I, I got to say for everyone on the call, about 80% of what we see in terms of costs really actually just come down to two things. It's ransomware and it's social engineering. So the quick and dirty on that is for anyone who doesn't know, uh, ransomware the biggest devastating impact of the business is that all of their data gets locked up and encrypted, which means that they're not fully operational. So all the employees show up and the boss is like freaking out because no one can work. And they extort the hackers, uh, the actual business and say, we need X amount of Bitcoin or um, whatever cryptocurrency. Uh, to unlock your data. Now, most of the modern ransomware that's out there will actually uh, look for financial documents and they're trying to aim to see the size, the, the revenue size of the business to raise that extortion cost up. Uh, and then in the insurance world, and I'm sure some of the people on the panel here have had some experience uh, with this as well. Uh, immediately, obviously we have a data breach attorney involved but they're going to bring in a forensics expert and they're the forensics ex expert is going to figure out exactly what strain of ransomware it is, how they got in. Uh, we're going to start asking the right questions of, do you have that information backed up? Best practices usually are if you can get that information offline because it rates where it can hit the cloud. And then uh, ultimately uh, they're the forensic expert is then going to negotiate based upon the cards that we have. So if we can't get their data back because it wasn't backed up or the backups got encrypted as well with ransomware, we're looking at paying that uh, ransomware extortion costs. 
and extortion costs it can get into the millions of dollars. Uh, once all that's said and done, it's down to the honesty and integrity of the hacker to unlock that data. And it's down to the strain of the ransomware if it will actually decrypt everything. So you might pay the hackers and you might get 50% of your data back. And then the cost continues to build in terms of forensic experts actually rebuilding your data so you're fully operational again. So well, heavy, hey, Michael, heavy I, yeah. Recently, I, I was I was supposed to be in Vegas for some conferences, <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, MGM, right? That's pretty in the news, right? Literally, yeah. and I, I'm a, I'm a Marriott uh, um, a flyer, so I, I pretty high frequent flyer at Marriott. They couldn't do anything for me. They were like, our systems are down. And then when you read the news, essentially the hackers scared MGM so much that they did not trust their own backups. They just took everything offline. And the hackers were kind of laughing that you guys overreacted and put yourself out because you know you couldn't get into the rooms, no drinks, no food, no gambling. Uh, I mean, th this is pretty critical for one of the most major players in the Vegas strips, right? Yes, and that was insured uh, in a hundred million dollar tower uh, globally. So Lloyd's of London had a lot of that capacity. But you would insure only on the on the response side. You you don't insure on how they operate, right? So if they make a bunch of losses because they overreacted, that's not for you. Uh, we have a say in it. Yeah. So and that's if the claim is going to pay out or not. If they're you know, as part of the contractual language, they have to be working with us within 48 hours and listening to our forensic experts and data breach attorneys. Um, but uh, yeah, that loss in particular, what paid out the most, what paid out that $100 million is we'll cover for every day that they're down um, all of the business interruption lost profit so for a casino which is a class of business my company will not write uh anymore after we paid a three million dollar claim um it is a lot of money every single day that you are down um the one other point which i think is super important is uh social engineering and it's really really simple uh hackers if you go on the dark web you can find almost anyone's um, email address and their uh, passwords. How how is that the case? And this is just a lot of the education we do uh, with businesses. It's every single time you've signed up for anything on the internet where you've had to create a username and password. If that third party got hacked, so to give you an idea, most people have LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been hacked multiple times. Um, that means your email address and the password you might have reused hundreds of times could be floating around for hackers just to try and attempt to attack. So what they do is they'll go after your real email. And when you have a business email, if uh, what they're going to look for is people that are in direct control of sending money. And once they're into a financial controller's email address, all they're doing is just changing the bank account details. So both parties don't think anything's happening. And then the money's just gone one day. And that's that's a social engineering loss. So really good to get kind of that education because ransomware is definitely they're looking for vulnerabilities with employees to get into the network. And they're usually attacking kind of the more privileged access users. Uh, but social engineering is, is just, you know, anyone that's has access to money and, and a business email address. And so it's, it's, again, it's back to the people that caused the actual attacks. Michael, I'll, I'll just add to, to the social engineering piece. You don't even need to do it online. What you can do very often, let's say local government departments have a published list of uh, suppliers that, that, uh, supply services because they have to go out to tender. So what we've seen in the past is where um, criminals will literally send an email ostensibly from one of the suppliers 
saying, hey, we are really happy to keep doing work with you and we love doing work with if your, your government department. However, we just need to let you know our details, our payment details are changing. You now need to start paying invoices to these bank account details. And this is a paper letter sent with an official company letterhead that looks like the actual letter. So someone in accounts receivable will pick that up or look at that and go, okay, cool, we need to make the, the amendments. Now, no one knows any better at this point. The only time anyone's going to know is when the actual company that should be paid rings that local government department up and says, hey, we're waiting for these payments to come through. They haven't come through. And, and the, the local government department says, hang on, but we have paid it. We've been paying it to this new bank account. And they say, what bank account are you talking about? The one that you sent a letter for that said you need to update your details. We never sent that letter. All right. And these are, these are traditional social media engineering attacks that happen all right, using physical based um, uh, old school snail mail. Right? And it happens, at a, at a, at a, at, of course, at a, at a digital level as well. And this involves training people to make sure that when they get those sorts of letters or those sorts of emails, they pick up the phone, not on the phone number that's on that email or the letter. They actually pick up the phone to their supplier and say, hey, we've received this. Is this legitimate or not? No, it's not. You don't make the change, right? So this is where it becomes really, really difficult. Some of these are actually quite low tech attacks, but work devastatingly well. And one thing I want to add there, Tony, I can guarantee that these, uh, that these, you know, hacker emails or messages on LinkedIn or whatever have gotten much better since the advent of chat GPT, because now like before there's always typos or something's wrong, something looks fishy. Now the, these attackers are writing, you know, somewhat lucid emails. They look somewhat real. So, um, you know, anyone who like the, the potential like risk is much higher now because it's harder to spot fishy things. So um, I definitely want to touch on this later, but one of the kind of core ideas of like being able to, to truly identify whether someone is who they, who you think they are, that's becoming a really big uh, part of cybersecurity. One of the things I'll uh, sort of add to it as well is that it used to be that organizations viewed their employees as their weakest link. And now by buttressing their knowledge, they can become their greatest strength and greatest deterrent uh, against anything that might uh, sort of crack in. Uh, I'd like to, I've got a couple of questions coming in to our panel. May I uh, throw those questions out to you as well from our audience? Uh, one of the questions is uh, from uh, Amos Young, can you clarify some of the ways hacking groups determine how much they can charge a organization to return their systems to them? He says, I've heard something about hacking groups searching documents uh, to determine the value of the company. As an example, one of the many ways. Um, he says, my wife owns a performing art school, a small yet impactful nonprofit organization. The school contracts with the vendor to manage our class schedule, parent portals, and payment processing. We need to evaluate whether these vendors have proper cybersecurity mechanisms in place to protect our organization's data. Where can I find a list of questions to ask the vendor? Additionally, should you download all the data to have a backup in case of a system outage? And how should this be done? I know this is more than one question, but if you want to sort of tackle first, which is uh, how do you determine uh, the value of a company? How do hackers do that? Yeah, it, it depends what they've gotten into information-wise. So they're going to look for sensitive information, first and foremost. Um, so if they have health records, as an example, extortion costs go up because they know it's regulated uh, in the U.S. Uh, and then obviously the financial records. But you got to think about it this way. If you were born in Russia and you had access to the Internet and you could make an unlimited amount of money and it was not illegal to hack countries outside of Russia, because that's, that's the rules there. Why wouldn't you create a business and hire people just to spread ransomware to businesses in the United States? And that's literally what happens. So our forensic experts actually know specific um, usernames and specific ransomware brands uh, that are associated with 
uh, very specific hacking groups. And due to the quantity of claims that we've handled, they can actually spot, oh, based upon this particular hacking group, I know that we can negotiate them down to X amount in their extortion. Because you got to remember, it's a business for them. So they actually, they, the extortion can't be too high or they're not going to be paid. It's pretty wild. All case by case, though. Yeah. And, and Michael, to, to add to your comments, 100% agreed. Um, very often, um, you, you hit the nullity head around uh, the type of information you're looking for. We, we also have a forensics practice that, that we do some work where very often we find that what they're looking for is the cyber insurance policy. So the hackers are looking for the cyber insurance policy. And very often, the amount of ransom they request is somewhere in the order of what the insurance policy is going to pay out because their, their belief is that if they're insured, they'll just pay. Right, so there, there, there is, there is a, a of course, um, the demand has to be uh, reasonable um, and within the means of that organisation to pay. Very often, we find organisations are, are in a position where they they might be thinking about paying, and then there's a scramble of actually getting cryptocurrency. So often, organisations are now keeping cryptocurrency on file in case they ever need to pay. Um, our view is never pay if you if you um, can avoid doing so but that involves having the right backups and processes and the question did go back to that backups and processes and controls if you can restore your systems from a backup then you may not have to pay at all and that would be the ideal option in all cases but to do that you need to have cyber risk management um, uh, taking place at a, at a much earlier phase and by the time you get breached because at that point it's too late so this goes into my next question where does business continuity plan uh, planning fit into all of this? I, I can go first here. So business continuity, from my perspective, and this might differ with other panelists, I see it as having kind of an interesting co-relationship between security and IT, um, obviously as, you know, impacts beyond that. But um, from what I've seen, it does fit in pretty naturally with incident response processes. So this is something we do a lot is working with companies to actually, you know, create basic incident response processes or refine them or improve them. Um, but uh, business continuity planning, planning for anything that could go wrong and having a, you know, game plan to get your business back on track is very important um, and does have a, you know, a quite symbiotic relationship. Um, I did want to actually touch back on the previous topic. I know we were talking about ransomware. Um, and great, you know, great stuff. The impact of it is cannot be uh, understated of the, the the risk ransomware brings. And I recently attended a uh, security summit, and I learned one of the the main takeaways I got from it was that uh, ransomware is extra risky because um, obviously, you know, a hacker potentially has sensitive business data that you don't want uh, an attacker, to, a hacker to have. But for uh, for many hacker groups. If they're a registered, you know, terrorist organization or registered by the FBI, you cannot even pay the ransom. You've the, your data is, is gone. Poof, you can't even get your data back. So being able to um, restore your data and have backups and quickly access it is so important because we're seeing increased prevalence of nation state attackers, uh, you know, hacking hacking our data, or hacking you know American or other allied data and selling it or ran ransoming it off. So something something that I learned recently that, that is very insightful mm -hmm. and I wanted to share with you guys. Well, I would say that um, the information security career agenda is basically focused on three letters, confidentiality, so keeping things hidden, obfuscation, integrity is also another piece of that, which is, making sure that things are immutable, they don't change unnecessarily or changes are recorded. And then availability, which is really around resilience and ability to recover. So CIA has always been sort of the tenant of information security. I probably am calling out a little terms that most people don't know, but ACF2, RACF, I used to work on those systems, which are mainframe security systems. And uh, that's the principle that, that was working back in the day. It's still the principle that works, works today. And Stefan, you're right. It is very, very connected. You can 
have people hack you all day if you can be resilient or recover very quickly, right? So they they take it down, you bring it back up, you have a secure backup that's has integrity, is confidential, nobody else can go and, and change it. So denial of service, which most of the time is is the 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 joyriders hack, you can bring it back up pretty quickly. And then when you talk about ransomware, it also compromises really the integrity and availability question in CIA. So if you have the ability to understand the integrity of your data and where it comes from and it's not been tampered with and you can bring it back very quickly, then that's great. And there's a whole profession out there uh, just for many of uh, uh, the attendees. Um, you know, within the cybersecurity space, you have privacy, you have security, and then you really have the continuity or or resilience bit, which, you know, people spend a lot of time around writing up uh, disaster recovery plans, business continuity plans, making sure those work and are resilient to attacks. Um, that's, and then, and to Stefan's uh, earlier comment, it ties into the incident response uh, uh, activity today, right? So if you can make that a smooth transition, you actually are creating a lot of value for the company in terms of uh, being more resilient and more impervious to, to failures from attackers. So I'm not too sure if I'm answering that question, but that's why it's, it's really relevant for me. Yeah, it's pretty clear that the CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability is key for business continuity. A additional reason why it is key for business continuity is it ties back to the asset inventory and management that is so essential to understand the vulnerability and threat and risk to your particular organization. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I know uh, uh, Stephanie is sort of writing an answer, but uh, I think it's it's pertinent for a, a lot of students out there. Uh, as here's a question from our uh, audience uh, member: As a, ma a business major with no technical or coding skills. What are some ways I can break into the cybersecurity field? Internships, first job. Um, I know Keith, you're <laughs> probably at the pick to maybe uh, uh, suggest something as well. Um, so there are three things that are necessary to get a job currently in the cybersecurity field. The first is education. About two thirds of degrees require a four year degree. About 20% of them require a master's degree. Um, a growing number of non-traditional degree pathways exist for those with a technical background, but not necessarily an educational background. The second issue is industry-recognized professional certifications, of which the CompTIA Vendor Agnostic Security Plus sequence would be widely viewed as the, the, the floor. The ceiling there, of course, is the CIS for the CISSP, for those that have, are familiar, unfamiliar with that acronym, and everything in between that. And third is work experience, and you need one year of work experience as a minimum to get into the field. Three to five years, you're probably like a tech two, tech three kind of a thing. And after about eight years, you're probably considered senior in, in this field. And if you are missing any one of those three areas, ooh, yeah, it's not going to be. Your job outlook is very, very low. Sorry. Um. Keith, can I just add to, to what you've just said? My suggestion to, and the questioner asks a really good question, is what do you want to do within the world of cybersecurity, right? Because, um, and, and you said you're a business major with no technical or coding skills. You may not necessarily need technical or coding skills because if you want to work in the legal realm or the insurance realm, it's important to understand the fundamentals of cybersecurity, and that's, of course, you know, the, the IT concepts and, and the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and, and what that looks like. But you may be able to work in an area of cybersecurity that, that is um, going to be able to make use of your business background, risk management being a really good example, or back, and business continuity planning, uh, or governance, right? where there are opportunities and there are a lot of opportunities, but you may not necessarily need to learn the highly technical side of cybersecurity. Now, to Keith's point, there are certifications. In fact, the CISSP, and I used to work for ISC2 who, who run the CISSP, where you don't need to have those skills. You need to have experience in two of the eight subject areas that they, they've included. Um, and if you can do that, then you can still be accredited um, in, in that 
realm. So my suggestion to you would be look at what you enjoy doing and what you really want to focus your career on. Find those cybersecurity roles that match what your interests are, where you want to really align yourself to, and then go off and learn what you need to to attain um, that, that position. Network with people that work in that space. Ask them, uh, and, and they'll be able to give you really good guidance and support as well. I just add maybe one other industry that wasn't mentioned because you got legal um, and you got insurance, but then also the cybersecurity software companies. I have so many friends that work in sales for those companies and make an absolute killing. Uh, and they're huge and they keep growing uh, and there's new ones emerging all the time. And just to add all those uh, cybersecurity companies need, you know, support, they need enterprise support, they need, uh, you know, uh, marketing. So there's a ton of cybersecurity companies out there. Uh, some of the fastest growing companies on earth are cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. um, so tons of opportunity there. And then also just sharing the route I went down. Uh, I started out with GRC. So security, so kind of cybersecurity audit. Uh, that's also a pretty good path for anyone with accounting uh, background. So that worked quite well for me. Big four is always hiring. I know LMU is a great relationship. So that's a great path for a lot of you. I would say that the cybersecurity agenda is still emerging. We've had a couple of chats about AI, automation, uh, international, other um, industry segments, HIPAA, et cetera. Um, it is really expansive. It's very hard for uh, traditional technology companies to consolidate that. You see that in the ERP world, they consolidate very quickly. In the data analytics world, they consolidate automation world, they consolidate... But for some reason, and in the information security world, nobody owns a firewall, an incident response, uh, endpoint management, and all that at once, uh, because it's it, those are very complex issues, and they address a lot of business issues. And this is the exciting part for our audience here: is you can use your business acumen, your liberal arts education and bring together this technical STEM kind of base uh, a skill set and still really be impactful to the business. And I, I wasn't kidding, you know, an actuarial, who would think an actuarial would be, you know, but if you are studying that, you're a quant and you're in the analytics and the math and you're able to do that and you can understand cybersecurity, the 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 cyber insurance world is big it's really huge and michael you're you're kind of you know one of the uh, startups for us as an alum thank you and uh you know and and i think there's a lot there that we can go in other skill sets that can can really leverage cybersecurity not just as a technical ability but a business impact ability so i i would i would highly encourage everybody to um consider um, looking at what you're working on and um, not worried about the cybersecurity business being uh, diminished, but actually looking at it as being very, very robust for years to come. So I'll pause there. And I just maybe one other comment. After we hired probably at least 25 people out of college in the last eight years, uh, I would get on internships every single summer. Uh, and maybe do some part-time internships throughout um, all four years at LMU. That's like the immediate thing of like getting a job of like what we're going to look at if we're hiring you out of college. And then um, I would be networking with people, uh, you know, the lowest hanging fruit there is LMU alum. Um, and if you are talking to people kind of at various years of their career, so someone five years out is going to have a pretty good idea of how they just got in of where the marketplace is at that um, kind of at that moment. Very different from someone who's in their fifties or sixties, who's had a very long career and a lot of insight uh, and can give you a lot of advice of what they learned throughout their career. So um, they preach that in the entrepreneurship program and I, I did it. And that's how I got to kind of the point with my own company of being able to start it um, and move really, really fast. Great, thank you. Um, that sort of naturally flows into uh, my next 
area that's related is what do you think the future of cybersecurity is going to be? Where do you think it's headed? I know certainly no one's going to disagree that there's an incredible amount of job opportunities, but just in any dimension. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start. I think that the opportunities, I mean, I don't want to sound cheesy, but it, it is limitless. Um, I think that um, in the information security space, uh, we actually need more disciplined business thinkers, process thinkers, uh, people who understand what the word risk really mean and what the equation is. You know, risk is not just, oh, it could happen. And risk is like, is it worthwhile for us to spend the money or not? Because if I make more money than I lose, maybe that's okay, right? So there, there is these equations that you need to kind of put your head around. And there's a lot of program management type of skill also, because you're working across lawyers, accountants, uh, technologists, business people, salespeople. You're going to work with a lot of salespeople in, in cybersecurity because it is a very large ecosystem and you're going to rely on these vendors to follow through on their commitments. And so you need to be able to push them. And so these skill sets are, are really, really important, uh, as well as, you know, having the strong foundation of understanding the academics of cybersecurity. So I would say that, um, you know, that's that's the starting point, And that's that's where you could you could kind of create your opportunity. I came from, um, you know, a more business perspective, even though uh, growing up, I was technical. And I chose the business path. I, I was a, an undergrad and I did the MBA at Loyola. And with my MBA, basically what I did was I, I took my technical skill set and went into management and tried to you know, manage or orchestrate solution sets for my clients. So this is uh, this has been pretty good for me. So hopefully if anyone wants to travel this path, Danny, I'm going to jump in because very similar to you, uh, I have a computer science background and I did an executive MBA, which actually involved um, study in California, uh, interestingly enough, because I realized from a technical perspective, uh, I thought I was good uh, from a management perspective and a leadership perspective, I could definitely improve. Um, and in fact, now, uh, and, and this is a, directly related to the question around what's the future of cybersecurity. Um, I am in the middle of a, almost at the end of my JD. So I'm doing a law degree here, here in Australia um, because the world of cyber and law have not, are not colliding. They have collided. Um, and, and I knew this would happen many, many years ago. Um, and I had some, some legal practitioners who said to me, this is something where, where you really want to um, uh, focus on. And apparently they said I had a personality of a lawyer, so I should do it. And I said, oh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> so, um, you know, for those of you that might be thinking where, where are opportunities, um, there, there are huge opportunities and the legal piece around cyber. You have where, a law school. There you go, right? Uh, the legal piece around cyber um, and privacy, which is highly legal dependent. And of course, the insurance piece um, is going to be only growing, um, you know, infinitely from from here going forward. So if you're that way inclined, absolutely, there's an opportunity there. And you'll find that we're, we're going to be getting more and more into the legal depths. Um, wait till you start seeing some of the precedent law cases that will come out of various jurisdictions and, and it will explode in that area. There's a meteoric growth right now in cybersecurity employment. It's a trillion dollar industry. It'll be a multi-trillion dollar industry before very long. I think that a lot of folks think of cybersecurity as a purely technical field, and they are actually now beginning to realize that as a people field, um, that the management capabilities and capacities of our organizations needs to be upgraded. Our HR folks need to be better at hiring cyber professionals, vetting those applications, and really having a meaningful look at the talent that is coming past them and the second big future issue here is relating to AI, large learning module, uh, large learning models, uh, data analytics, all of these related areas that either reinforce and feed into cybersecurity or cybersecurity feeds into. I'm not sure how much longer it's going to be 
<clears throat> excuse me, cybersecurity and AI or AI and cybersecurity, right? So those would be my future prognostications. Yeah, and much in the same vein, Keith, I, I definitely think, I definitely like what you said about cyber's future being with people. I think, you know, companies understanding when they need to do cyber themselves and what to, you know, ship to a third party, buy insurance for, that's going to be a big thing going forward. Um, we've already seen a lot of companies, you know, uh, in recent rounds of layoffs, they realize they can't afford their in-house cyber team, so they'll go with third parties. That's something that happens. AI uh, cannot stress that, you know, it might seem like just a new buzzword to people, but it is fundamentally changing the way people use IT infrastructure. Uh, the increased importance of data and data storage and, um, you know, going back to business co continuity and disaster recovery, data is uh, the oil of tomorrow. So protecting your data is going to be, you know, even more important than it is today. And, um, you know, AI has has its own risks associated with it. Um, there's some really interesting um, vulnerabilities coming out of large language models like you know, uh, you know, poisoning, data poisoning, or uh, other things of that nature, where the the data itself can be compromised in subtle ways that people might not be able to protect or detect, rather. So there's some really interesting use cases coming out with AI, and I really think um, you know everyone has to be aware. Everyone has to be aware of cybersecurity. It's going to seep to everyone's responsibility. I think um, you know using uh you know going back to what i wanted to talk about earlier around like identity um with this recent mgm attack uh and uh the attackers were able to hack uh, even hack people's 2fa codes right so even things we think are secure are not necessarily secure we have to think a level deeper with things like uh using you know hardware tokens to prove our identity so things so there's a lot of you know dynamic things happening in the cyber environment but everything really comes down to um, people and data. Those are the two big concepts I would think about as we move forward to the future. And Seth, I would just add, um, for those who are not aware, if I were looking for a job in cybersecurity, like in the actual kind of the companies we've seen start to boom in the last actually like 12 months, but they've been around for probably three to four years is the managed detection and response uh, business model where uh, they are packaging up a bunch of different cybersecurity solutions at a massive discount to the actual business in terms of the licensing costs. And they then have a team of cybersecurity professionals that are ingesting all of the data that goes into an individual business who uses their solution um, into those cybersecurity tools. And so they have thousands of clients. So they're, they're getting thousands of businesses data. And then uh, they're using machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to analyze that data. So if a red flag goes off of a company in Florida had some sort of uh, scare, uh, a vulnerability was detected or attack happened, a company in California that's also a client of this MDR is now uh protected because the mdr has figured out oh okay this could apply to all types of businesses um so it's low cost and it's that data sharing model um and it's handled by the actual cybersecurity professionals when an attack does happen they shut it down really really fast uh, so yeah kind of cool where it's going cost efficient uh for the future for businesses Thank you, Michael. I'd like to squeeze in one more audience question, if I may. I think we've got the time. I want to respect everybody's time. Uh, the question is, knowing all the dangers of hackers and data breaches, how do you personally protect yourself? All right, I'll go first. Um, so I make sure I update all my devices. Uh, I make sure I have everything backed up. And perhaps crazily, maybe for, for some of the panelists, we haven't had too much disagreement on here. I'm happy to take some disagreement. Um, I back all of my personal photos, my family, my kids' photos, once a year onto Blu-ray disc. I wrap them and I give them to someone that I know and they keep them in their safe. Because if my house ever burns down, I've got a copy of the things that I really, really, really care about, which is my kids and my photos. That's how I do it. 
you know, I would say that um, there is an implication to the social aspect of who we are and what we do and where we record what we're doing. So, you know, sometimes you may not want to post pictures of yourself. Sometimes you may not need to take that extra photo. And sometimes you need to be, you know, cos cognizant of the decisions you are making, which is recorded by something else, whether it's a credit card transaction, uh, a web browser history or whatever else. So I would think that, you know, and I don't know if it's appropriate, but within the Jesuit community, since we are here, you know, uh, living a life of good, having integrity, all those things are important. And uh, if you're concerned about that, you're probably going to need some augmentation to protect yourself. In other words, just to be sure you're using the right, you know, shadowing or black service on your website, um, have some password management technology, um, store your data elsewhere. That was a great one, Tony, because that's going back to what uh, Ken said earlier about, you know, business continuity and recovery, because you, you clearly see that in the event of a compromise, I need to have a a place where I can go, I can trust, and I can recover, right? So that that's that's a very good one. Uh, so these these are things that you know we all need to make decisions on. There are a lot of tools, but you need to make decisions on how you behave on the internet. It is not a free for all. You are in you are in front of a lot of people when you're on the internet. So behave like you would want your grandma and your kids to look at you. I mean, I'm. I'm that's that's just my thoughts. I'll pause there. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, uh, if you could say it in fifteen seconds, I'll let you, Michael, because I want to. Yeah, yeah. I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I want to pass it back to uh, uh, Dr. Young Sung Pak. But as go as ahead. Well, we can do it quick. You you can talk as much as you want. Okay, go I'll, for it, I'll, Michael. I'll, go, I'll get it to five seconds. That's for okay. starters. For starters, um, just stop reusing the same passwords. Uh, get on. I mean, uh, password keepers can be hacked, but they are pretty secure and you can generate passwords and you're never going to remember all your passwords. So <laughs> start there and just know that anytime uh, you are, especially around banks collecting um, if there's any sensitive data. So if anyone gets in your email, it can pretend to be you. Um, if there's multi-factor authentication, turn it on. It's usually free. Uh, you just need to look it up and see if they offer it. Um, and you will protect yourself a lot better than most people. Keith? Minimize, minimize high risk activities and use, use common sense while clicking. And if you are in doubt, you, you should probably not click or go to that site until you can verify where it's going. Most of mine have already been said, but really the the sim the the kind of the simplest thing is you know take a second before you enter private information and think about what you're actually doing. I know hackers tend to exploit our reward systems, and you know getting free stuff <laughs> online is appealing. But just stop and think about what you're really where you're really putting your information in. So that's it's essentially like your key. So what are you really unlocking? Think about it. Thank you very much. I'll pass it on to. Uh... Dr. Well, thank you, Ken, for moderating such a stimulating and enlightening panel discussion. I learned a lot from this fascinating conversation. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We have to wrap up this webinar. Thank you to our you know, great panelists, Keith, Stefan, Michael, Danny, and Tony, for sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and critical topic today. Finally, I also like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program and we'll be back with another program pretty soon, actually the next week uh, with the new title, Digitization of the Asian Economy. Please, please look for our emails to get more detailed information about these events. As you leave this webinar, you will be asked to fill out a short survey I would really appreciate it if you can give us feedback to today's program. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.